<laughs> you didn't hate me before. Sponsored by Curiosity Stream with Nebula. Apple's App Store is under attack. They're being sued by Spotify in the EU and Epic in the US. Some developers, big and small, beyond salty over a host of gripes, new and institutional, real and imagined. Gamers are pissed over the lack of Xbox streaming and regulators have them in their sites as well. Breaking out all the old favorites, monopoly abuse, anti-competitiveness, antitrust, and they, well, they don't operate with lasers. They operate with hammers, giant, gotten damarong, mialnir-like hammers. So what can Apple do? Or more to the point, what should Apple do? In this video, I'm gonna go over what's most commonly being suggested from sideloading and alternate app stores to cutting the 30% and offering alternate payment options, as well as the positives and negatives, the risks and rewards, and how all of that could affect you. And I'm gonna do it right now. Okay, so I'm gonna break this down into three sections. Yeah, like D'Angelo Wallace, except less with the YouTube drama and more with the app store drama. I'm also gonna cover as many angles and points of view as I possibly can, because I think in many cases, not everyone is considering views beyond their own, like how stressful the app store can be for developers and online transactions in general for mainstream customers. In this first section, I'm gonna talk about the famous or infamous 30% cut, the one that Apple takes, and it's gonna be the longest, so bear with me because it's important and because it sets the stage for alternate payment systems in the second section and sideloading in the third. And yet, yeah, just go ahead and hit the subscribe button and bell right now because I'm gonna get way too involved in all of this and forget to remind you later. Cool? Cool. So when Steve Jobs announced the App Store back in 2008, he also announced what's known as the agency model. See, in traditional wholesale models, which is common in brick and mortar retail, the manufacturer sets a price for the retailer and then the retailer sets a price for the customer. The typical wholesale model split is 45% for the manufacturer and 55% for the retailer, which aligns with the real world costs of selling in the real world. It's what Walmart uses, Amazon, Best Buy, pretty much every retailer of physical goods. There's a manufacturer's suggested retail price, sure, but the retailer has the final say. They can charge more if there's increased demand, gouge even, or less, even below cost if they wanna have a sale or liquidate. With the agency model though, the retailer doesn't set the price, the manufacturer does. The manufacturer decides what the regular price is and if and when they choose to have a sale, what the sale price is. And the retailer gets a percentage of that price. The typical agency model flips the split around though, with 70% for the manufacturer and 30% for the retailer, which was supposed to better align with the costs of selling in the digital world rather than the real one. That's the model and the percentage Apple uses for the App Store. It's the model Google uses for the Play Store. And it's the model Microsoft, Sony, and Nintendo use for the Xbox, PlayStation, and Switch stores. And in the beginning, most people thought it was great. It opened up development and distribution to the masses and made apps go mainstream. It was a golden age. And the pie was growing so fast, very few people stopped and even cared to think about Apple getting a 30% slice. Because 70% of something so much new something was worth way more than 100% of very little or nothing. But then a couple of major things changed. First, that original app market. It went from scarcity to abundance, high value to high volume, premium to freemium. We can blame Apple for commoditizing their compliments, Google and Facebook for making apps free as in data, venture capitalists for growth hacking user numbers over revenue numbers, developers for racing to the bottom and training customers to wait for sales, or users for simply not wanting to pay as much for an app as they would for, I don't know, a s'mores frap. But it wasn't any one of them. It was a confluence of all of them and more. What was happening to apps was the same as what's happened to every other form of digital content. It was losing all physical and individual value. Going from $10 for a single CD or DVD to $10 a month for all you can stream on Spotify or Netflix. From a couple bucks a paper for news to free on your Facebook or Google feed. What factories and big box stores were to artisans, frameworks and app stores were to indie devs. All the breaks were just taken off access and scale. Second was in-app purchases. On one hand, big developers, especially big game developers, learned early on that while people weren't willing to pay even two bucks for a digital game up front, we'd shell out $20 a day just to flex better skins than our friends or get our cars back on the track faster. Basically, instant and ego gratification, gamification, PSYOPs, like casinos. These goods, these skins, emotes, incubators, costumes, power-ups, they all had zero marginal cost. Literally database entries. 
may be the most pure profit legal business ever imagined. And as the numbers increased, as the zeros behind them grew, some of the companies became less and less eager to share all that money with anyone else. For example, Epic with the Play Store or App Store. On the other hand, aggregators began using the agency model themselves. They were bundling up audiobooks or eBooks or comic books or licensing music or movies and either keeping 30% themselves or paying per play. And that meant they couldn't afford to then be super aggregated up by Apple in the App Store, who was essentially bundling apps and keeping 30% as well. There was just no room for multiple aggregators, no way for Amazon and Apple to both keep the same 30% off the sale of the same Kindle book. And in all those cases, either because indies were being squeezed, aggregators were being caught in the middle, or game studios were getting all the gluttonous, Apple's 30% cut became increasingly irksome, untenable, or simply unpalatable to them. Apple, meanwhile, was worried that developers would cut them out of the App Store revenue cycle entirely, leave Apple stuck handling all the platform and fulfillment costs for quote unquote free apps that made a fortune off in-app purchases. Now, that was already true for physical goods, Walmart or Best Buy or Amazon, hell, Domino's. If you were a retailer selling a chair or speaker or hard copy of a book or pizza, you could use whatever account system you already had on the web. But for digital goods, at least at first, free apps had to stay free. You could show ads, and a brief failed attempt at iAds aside, Apple didn't take any cut of the ad money, but you couldn't use IAP at all. Then that changed. But if you offered IAP, you had to use Apple's IAP and associated payment system. You couldn't just have Apple fulfill your free app while you kept all the money through a web transaction. You couldn't even link to or mention web transactions. And that was fine, if irksome, for apps selling their own pure profit digital goods. But it was untenable for aggregators who were licensing or otherwise brokering their digital goods from others. And that's basically where we still are now, today. Things have evolved slightly. Apple's revenue share for subscriptions acquired through the App Store drops from 30% to 15% after the first year. And there's a class of apps considered readers. What Apple says includes magazines and newspapers, books, audio, music, video, access to professional databases, VoIP, cloud, storage, and approved services like classroom management apps. Those don't have to offer IAPs through the App Store at all, but can instead show a login so you can use your existing Netflix or Kindle account or whatever. It's not a great first run experience for customers, far from it, but this is big business money we're talking about. Getting classification as a reader app though seems arbitrary, as we saw with the Hey Email app earlier this year. Also, Amazon apparently used the Prime Video app as leverage to get Apple to allow Amazon accounts as a payment option. Now, Netflix getting subscriptions lowered to 15%, and Amazon Prime getting their own accounts is normally just how business works. Big companies use big leverage and big dollars to get big deals. The problem is Apple has over and over again stated they treat all apps the same, that the smallest, newest indie dev has an equal opportunity sitting on the app store shelf next to the biggest, most established incumbents in the game. And a lot of indie devs see that beautiful dream juxtaposed against the harsh reality of big business as usual, and it makes them apoplectic. So what can Apple do here? Well. When Steve Jobs originally announced the App Store, he said the 30% cut was just to cover the costs of running the App Store, that they'd be happy if they even broke even. That was when paid apps still charged a premium and free apps were actually free as in hobbies, ads, or front ends. Now, in the age of IAP and subscriptions, the whole economy has changed. Some assume Apple is just drowning in App Store profits, that they promised Wall Street they'd double services revenue from 2016 to 2020 and most services revenue is the App Store, and most of that is IAP games. And guess what? Apple managed to double that revenue and do it a few months ahead of schedule. Go team money. But that's not entirely true. About 85% of apps are free as in don't pay Apple 30% already, nothing beyond the $99 annual developer program charge. Of the revenue Apple gets from the App Store, it's estimated 65% comes from games. But that revenue, the App Store revenue, represents only air quotes only, a third of Apple services revenue. Now, some developers feel the 30% is just fine, or rather, they believe it provides sufficient value to justify the costs. It delivers customers willing and eager to pay, and 30% of that is worth much more than 100% of the alternative. In other words, they have no issue with it, not from Apple, not from Xbox, not from anyone. Epic famously believes it's fine for game consoles that typically sell hardware at low or no margin, 
and provide much better partner services for big game studios like Epic, but not for smartphones, which are typically sold at much higher margins, at least the ones made by Apple and Samsung, and offer far fewer partner opportunities. Other developers believe the 30% would be fine if Apple actually delivered on their end with higher quality frameworks that are fairly available to first and third party apps alike, better subscription and receipt handling, less opaque and capricious reviews, far fewer mistakes, and far more responsive and communicative developer relations. And still other developers think Apple's not entitled to a damn dime more than whatever the transaction fees are, a single digit, like any payment processor, like PayPal. Customers typically don't care about the 30% because they don't typically see it, might not even know about it. They do care that because of Apple's ongoing spat with Netflix and Kindle and other aggregators, that it's super not easy, really an inconvenience to subscribe to new services or buy new content directly on the iPhone or iPad. And some who know and care legit want developers to get a better deal. Others feel like if Apple lowered the 30%, the developer wouldn't pass the savings on to them anyway and just pocket the difference. So go right back to just not caring. And still others feel like Apple isn't doing enough, still letting scam apps and gross subscription schemes onto the store, putting dumb ad boxes on top of still mediocre search results, not forcing apps to update if they wanna stay on the store, and otherwise letting it become more of a commodity flea market and less of the high-end boutique Apple's been promising. In other words, quantity, not quality. Apple feels like they're paying for the operating systems, the frameworks that let any indie developer take on the biggest software houses in the world, Xcode and all the tools, connect in the entire management system, all the hosting, delivery, including app thinning and bitcode, taxes internationally from the US to Japan and back, which is apparently as complex as it sounds. Review, providing a single storefront everyone knows to go to, promotions on the store for some, but not all apps, and simple payment systems everyone trusts, and that all of that costs money and provides value well worth the 30%, and that developers who don't like it are just looking for a free ride and expecting platforms to behave even more like charities and get upset when their scams get caught and go running to social and the press just to unfairly, illegitimately smear them. Now, some believe that since Apple doesn't actually make that much pure profit from the App Store, dropping their cut from 30% to 15% wouldn't even hurt their numbers that much. It'd just be slightly less than a little, like maybe not significantly at all. Smaller developers have suggested a progressive rate, where the more you earn, the more you pay. Bigger developers, of course, the opposite that the more you earn, the less you should pay, capped over a certain amount, in fact. Others that it doesn't matter because whatever Apple drops it to, be it 20%, 15%, 10%, that just shows they're willing to drop it. And then developers will just start bashing them all over again in a year or several and demand it be dropped again and again until it reaches zero. Or conversely, Apple pays them for the privilege of having the app on the platform, like cable networks bidding for football. The pushback on that is, yeah, the power dynamic is so vastly in Apple's favor that the slippery slope just <laughs> can't exist because it's actually a wall. Personally, I'm still debating between two different takes on this. The first is keeping it at 30%, but really delivering on the promise of the App Store for developers and customers alike. A real focus on eliminating scam apps, outdated apps, websites wrapped up as apps, even if it's only feasible for the top 100 apps in every category, the ones that have the most visibility. Also. No derelict frameworks, no capricious rejections, no accidental terminations, just no BS. Basically, rather than treating developers as second-class suppliers, treating them as first-class customers of App Store services, making developer sat every bit as much of a bragging point as customer sat. The second is that Apple should just suck it up and drop the rate to 15% for everything across the board, not dropping for dropping's sake, or even just for the optics, but to get the balance back towards break even. Apple's platform obviously provides tremendous value to developers, and apps obviously provide tremendous value to Apple's platform. So periodic adjustments to maintain that balance is just in the best interests of everyone, especially customers. Hit the like button if that makes you as happy as it makes me. Which one I land on though is gonna depend on these next two sections. Okay, so section two, let's talk alternate payment system. Some people who want alternate transaction systems say, Apple can simply pay for platforms and tools and fulfillment out of the $99 fee every full-on developer, including developers of free apps, get charged every year to be part of Apple's developer program. Maybe even charge a little more for that if they absolutely have to, to just break even. 
but then they should be forced to compete for the transaction fees based on merit, on providing a better service for developers and experience for customers than the PayPal's of the world ever could or would. People who don't want alternate transaction systems argue that the higher program fees unfairly burden small, side hustle, or just curious developers. And a big part of what made the App Store revolutionary is the single trusted payment system. That because no one ever has to worry about how to pay or whether they have an account or not with any other service or whether they can trust any old service, they're more likely to pay. That that's exactly why the App Store, despite being on fewer devices in the Google Play Store, typically generates more revenue for developers. And that by opening up the other payment options, we risk more people being scammed, which could have a chilling effect on the whole app economy. Basically, the sneezing in the soup. Of course, we just went over that Apple already allows alternate payment systems for retailer apps that sell physical goods. Again, in the Amazon or Best Buy or Walmart or Domino's app, you don't pay with your App Store account. You pay with your Amazon or Best Buy or Walmart or Domino's account or your credit card or whatever. And if there was gonna be any confusion or chilling effect, we'd have already seen it. And I mean, some people probably do get frustrated or scared and close the pizza app and pick up the phone instead, but not enough to cause any real chilling effect, not writ large. Also, because most people probably already know and trust Amazon and Best Buy and Walmart and Domino's and PayPal for that matter. And that may not be true if any old rando app could just push you out to any old rando webpage to take or scam a payment. Still others have suggested Apple do something closer akin to what Google does on the Play Store. And that is allow alternate payment systems for apps that have content that can be consumed outside the app. Not games, sorry Tim Epic, Google mandates play only payments for that, same as Apple, but for Netflix, Spotify, Kindle, Comixology, all the reader apps that are basically the exact type of content aggregating app I mentioned in the first section. Let those apps sell that content through Apple and or through their existing account system. Apple could even offer or require that those apps use Apple Pay, at least in the markets that have it. It may cause more scrutiny, but also engender more trust. And the cost would basically be at transaction level, which is at the absolute lowest end being bandied about. Either way, a single payment system is only one part of the App Store model, not the whole model kit. So it's tough to tease out which one part, if any, could actually break the whole damn thing. But sure, by all means, be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. On the other hand, alternate payment systems could effectively eliminate the hay problem. The Basecamp web-based front-end app Apple got all DHH bombed about earlier this year. Also, the Facebook online events problem where a developer wants to waive their content aggregation cut for a good cause, but also not have to foot the bill to Apple for their app aggregation cut. Likewise, the online classes problems as COVID-19 keeps most of us out of the classrooms. Maybe even the Spotify problem, because Apple would no longer be giving themselves an unfair monetary advantage as platform owner, de facto exempt from their own 30% cut. In other words, it would solve so many of the problems. Maybe not Xbox game streaming, but I covered that in depth in a previous video, link in the description. So why not games as well? Frankly, because that's where all the money is for everyone. Apple, Google, Microsoft, Sony, Nintendo, Valve, everyone. 65% of the 15% paying Apple that 30%. And that's a terrible reason. And some would argue free to play games are a terrible business like tobacco or Facebook. I have no answer for that, at least not yet. But let me know what you think in the comments. Part three, side loading. Finally, which means getting and installing apps outside the App Store, mostly from the web, mostly. Now, when Apple created the iPhone and when Steve Jobs announced the App Store, it was clear, 100% crystal clear they were using a console model, like a video game machine, but for all apps. They already had a general purpose computer with the Mac and that made it way more open for enthusiasts, but more intimidating for the mainstream. The iPhone was meant to be the other way around more restrictive for enthusiasts, but more approachable for the mainstream. And if the word console irks you there, if you are irked by it, feel free to use appliance or just managed computing environment. That part is just inarguable. The argument comes on whether or not now, some 10 years and a billion users later, it should stay that way. And some would argue that it simply can't, that our phones have become so important to so many people, the primary computing platform of our generation that it simply has to be opened up and become a general computing platform, that apps need to run on it as openly and accessibly and freely as any PC. Others, that it absolutely should not, that it's become so important, holds so much more private data, knows so much more about us than any PC ever did, that it has to protect our privacy, 
including and especially against the extra-legal actions of our own governments. And to do that, it has to stay every bit as managed. Every bit is locked down. Either way, if Apple was going to open up sideloading, how would that work? On Android, you tap your way through a bunch of warnings, grant a bunch of permissions, then tap on your APK, the Android package kit or app file, download and install away. On the Mac, with what Apple calls Gatekeeper, you go into Security and Privacy Settings, Authenticate, click on Allow Apps Downloaded From, and then choose App Store and Identify Developers. Or, if you're all live free and download hard, use Terminal to expose the third option, any app from anywhere. This means that developers can choose to have their apps in the store with all the centralization, visibility, trust, and any and all App Store exclusive features, but also all the sandboxing, payment conditions, and review processes that come with it or they can try and do everything themselves directly from their websites with far, far fewer restrictions, but a far, far greater cut of their per unit profits. Or they can do both, have an app store and a non-app store version, which is either the best or just most confusing of both worlds. People in favor of sideloading are quick to point out that it would mean any app Apple doesn't want on the store for any reason, like console emulators, could just be made available via sideloading. When China banned VPN apps, or if the US bans TikTok or WeChat, they could still be made available via sideloading, at least client side. Great firewalls can still block any and all server calls. Mostly though, if Apple insisted on keeping their cut at 30% and not allowing alternate payment methods, developers could still choose to fulfill the apps themselves and keep all the profit via sideloading. People who hate the idea of sideloading are just as quick to point out that it would allow porn and gambling and any matter of dark web front ends onto their kids' phones. Also, piracy, not just for emulator binaries, but for cracked apps and torrented content. And through all of that, it would open the iPhone and iPad up to malware, spyware, and adware at a hitherto undreamt of scale. And yes, I really did just say hitherto undreamt of. The Mac, though, had sideloading for decades before the advent of the Mac App Store but it was also a tiny, low-profile, unprofitable target for malware back then. Now, not so much. And we're seeing similar tensions between Apple trying to place iOS-like protections on what's traditionally been a completely open computing system, and malware other attacks just escalate. And every time a big game is not available on a certain store or in a certain country, we see malware-laden versions of it spreading as fast as any safe mirrors, or spyware from nation states meant to be used on their own citizens, journalists, and dissidents. And some, like Epic, don't think sideloading by itself is even acceptable because of how few people even know about it and how scary it seems to mainstream customers, the actual customers that they want. That's why what Epic actually wants is alternate stores, on the official stores, because they still want that initial convenience and trust and exposure, but then to just take over from there. So that they're no longer paying Apple or Google 30%, but having other developers pay them much as other developers do on the PC version of the Epic Game Store today. That way they can be masters of their own destinies. And yeah, keepers of just all the monies. Others argue that this will just make getting apps more complex, as people will have to figure out which store has which app and set up and remember accounts for each store, and it'll force them to use stores with just downright terrible experiences just to get games they want, like Fortnite. One middle ground would be Gatekeeper for iOS. In other words, sideloading but restricted to notarized apps, or apps that have developer accounts still signed and certified as trusted by Apple. Basically how the Mac is, but without the terminal command that just opens it up to everything. It wouldn't stop every bad app or bit of malware from getting on the system. Cat and mouse games, by definition, have fully functional, genius level cats and mice. With notarization though, if a mouse slips through, the cat still has a giant red mouse terminating button it can hit even after the fact, and not a real mouse, don't worry, a malware mouse, code, whatever. It's just a saying, relax about it. It also wouldn't stop governments from trying to pressure Apple into withholding notarization from apps they don't like, which is legit the only reason I'm not all in on Gatekeeper as the best of all compromise solutions. Another middle ground is progressive web apps, PWA. That means websites that act like native apps and have many, if not all the capabilities of native apps, but with maybe, just maybe, less ability to attack the system than truly native sideloaded apps. Apple currently doesn't support anywhere nearly the amount of PWA tech that Google does, citing some of the same security and privacy concerns Mozilla does. But there may be some functional middle ground there as well. Like a next generation version of Steve Jobs' infamous initial suite solution, back when the iPhone team just didn't have time to make an app store for version one and to hold people over while they raced to make one for version two. And since then, 
the alternate app distribution model Apple's talked about anytime anyone from Playboy to Congress has come calling about App Store policy. Web 2.0, HTML5, now progressive web apps. The pushback on this is that, like the future, high performance web apps are always coming but never quite arriving. That they're bloated and sluggish, less capable and yet more resource draining. Basically, that everyone hates what Electron apps do on laptops and don't want anything like them, any browser instances at all, anywhere near the batteries on their iPhones or iPads. Also, even with WebGL or a hypothetical web metal, they wouldn't solve for Fortnite, TikTok, or VPN apps at all. But realistically, none of this solves everything. Apple apps being granted higher levels of trust to permissions in private frameworks developer apps simply don't get and maybe shouldn't get. The lack of trials or demos or upgrade pricing, or that no developer should ever have to deal with any unreasonable fear or anxiety over any app they invest everything in simply being rejected for unexpected reasons. I'd even argue that none of this is the actual problem, the one I mentioned at the beginning, that apps are going mainstream the way every other type of content has, and developers, app creators, are being commoditized and crushed the way every other type of content creator is. But I'll cover that in the next video in this series. So seriously, hit the subscribe button and bell so you don't miss out. What sideloading, maybe an especially gatekeeper sideloading, does solve for is the biggest, bluntest, most mass driving storm breaker of a meteor hammer facing Apple and big tech collectively, the largely tech illiterate regulators that currently have them in their sights. And it's what's probably keeping YouTube specifically out of their sights because YouTube takes a 45% cut of ad revenue from creators, but also lets us have our own sponsors in our videos. Come on, you had to see that coming, right? Nebula is a streaming video platform I'm building along with my education creator friends like Legal Eagle, Lindsay Ellis, Thomas Frank, Mariana, Ali Abdal, and so many more. It's a place where we don't need to worry about demonetization or the tyranny of click-through rates, watch time, or the algorithm, or ads, basically YouTube's version of app review. And you can find all of my videos there completely ad-free. Also, Nebula Originals, like working titles, where we break down the intro sequences from some of our favorite shows. I just did Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And collaborate in ways that wouldn't work on YouTube. Like I was just in Half as Interesting's Big Brick Original and a recent episode of Alex Goes Bananas. So what does this all have to do with CuriosityStream? Well, as the go-to source for the best documentaries on the internet, they just love educational content and educational creators. And we worked out a deal where if you sign up for CuriosityStream with the link in the description, not only will you get CuriosityStream, you'll also get a Nebula subscription for free. And for a limited time, CuriosityStream is offering 26% off all their annual plans. And 26% off is, by contract, the best deal you'll find anywhere. So click the link in the description and get both CuriosityStream and Nebula for 26% off. Or you can just go to curiositystream.com slash Rene Ritchie. It's a great way to support this channel and educational content directly for just $14.79 per year. Per year. Just click on the link in the description or go to curiositystream.com slash Rene Ritchie. And clicking on the link really helps out the channel. For a ton more on Apple versus Epic and why I think Apple's particularly wrong about Xbox game streaming, click on this playlist right here. I go deep on what's happening, why, and what can be done about all of it. Seriously, just click the playlist and see you next video.